you so much for that introduction. Thank you to the first two speakers for the amazing starting out part of the amazing first two talks. Um, so as Sarah said at the beginning of this event, our theme is how to hold world worlds and beyond. And I am beyond excited to be the beyond portion of that theme. Uh, so what I'll be talking to you all about today is exoplanets. Uh, and so before I begin talking about that, I want to first introduce a little bit about my journey through science. Uh, so I've always been interested in science just because I was always a really curious kid. Uh, growing up, I always continually was asking why about everything, and I always wanted to know the reasons behind everything and how everything worked. So I was interested in all different fields of science, so I started out interested mostly in medicine, and I wanted to be a doctor, so I went to a lot of related events, and this is just a picture from one of them. I was at a National Youth Leadership Forum for Medicine in high school. Um, and then I was also the, I was very involved in my science club in high school, so I also went to these popsicle stick bridge, bridge building competitions where we would make these bridges out of popsicle sticks and try to hold the largest amount of weight, and you would be surprised how much weight some of these could hold, like up to thousands of pounds. It's just incredible. Uh, and so we went to these competitions and just like made the best bridges that we could and had a really great time, and that sort of introduced me to physics a little bit. Um, and then when I was at Berkeley and I was studying physics, then I had the amazing opportunity to intern at one of the NASA centers where I discovered astronomy. And I was just completely blown away by astronomy. I had no idea you could actually get paid to just like think about the stars all day and try to figure out cool new things about them. And so I thought it was just the absolute coolest thing, and I was completely inspired and decided that I wanted to be an astronomer. And in particular, what I study is the field of exoplanets. And usually when I tell people I study exoplanets, the first thing that they say is, oh, that's so cool, and then they'll pause for a second, and then they'll ask you, what actually is an exoplanet? Uh, because I had no idea what this was in high school, and I did not know what an exoplanet was. Uh, so just to kind of clear the air so you all know before I begin going into more depth about them. An exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star outside the solar system. So this is a picture of all the different solar system planets, not to scare. Um, and they're all orbiting the sun, which is the star that is closest to us. So the sun is a star just like all the other stars in the night sky, but it looks really big just because it's really close to us and we're orbiting it. Uh, so these are the eight different planets in our solar system. We also have Pluto, which is a dwarf planet in our solar system, and none of these are exoplanets. So the planets that I usually focus on are the ones that are around all of the other stars in the night sky. So when you look up, there are stars everywhere. Um, there's light pollution as well, but if you're especially in a very dark place, there will be lots and lots of stars and something sort of like this image. And all of those stars, we also expect to have planets around them. So those are the planets that I'm most interested in. And so first of all, these weren't actually discovered until pretty recently because these planets are pretty far away and kind of hard to learn much about. So the nearest star is actually 4.2 light years away, which means that if you travel at the speed of light, which is the fastest that anything can possibly travel, then it still takes you 4.2 years to get to the closest star. And so we don't really know if these planets existed, we can speculate for hundreds of years, like they're probably there, but we don't really know for sure. Um, and it's particularly interesting because there are 100 billion stars in the galaxy, and there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So there are probably some, some planets out there that kind of resemble Earth, and we just have to find them and try to learn more about them. It's kind of the idea that we're following. Um, so what can we learn about these, and how do we actually study these worlds that they're so far away? Right. So the main method that we use to study exoplanets, or kind of most arguably successful method, that has been used in a lot of detention surveys, is called transit photometry. And what is happening in this is that oftentimes, if you stare at stars for a really long time, and if they have a planet in front of them, you may end up, if you want to be seeing an event where a planet actually moves in front of the star that's orbiting. So if a dark object that is not really emitting a lot of light moves in front of a light object that is emitting a lot of light, then you'll end up seeing a dip in this total amount of light that you see if you're just staring at that one star. Um, so 
so we are able to resolve these stars, but we can't actually see this like, next distant light. They just kind of look like a little dot to us. But what we are able to see is just if you stare at that dot, like, does that dot stay as bright as it was before, or does it get a little bit dimmer over time? And so what we are able to observe is sort of this plot where over time you'll see, okay, it looks pretty bright, and then it dips for a little bit, so that means that planet moved in front of the star, and then it goes back up to the planet and moves out of the way. Um, and so this is called transit photometry. One of these events is called a transit. Um, so the Kepler Space Telescope, which is a satellite that was launched into space, um, began searching for these transit events in 2009, and it had a main mission where it stared at this one spot in the sky for about three years until 2012, when it kind of had an extended mission that only looked at other regions of the sky later on. And this was looking for these transit events. So it just kind of stared at this one spot for a really, really long time, and the scientists didn't really know entirely what to expect. But they said, okay, well, maybe we'll find some of these, and maybe we'll and be able to learn a lot more about planets from them and be able to detect these events. And Kepler was just unprecedentedly successful. It was just absolutely insane how much we learned from Kepler. It was amazing. So we found something like 2,600, I think, confirmed planets from Kepler. And it was actually retired just a couple of weeks ago. So you may have seen this in like New York Times, perhaps. Um, where on October 30th, Kepler finally ran out of fuel this year. Um, which is very tragic and we're all very sad, but it was an excellent telescope and did a really great job. Um, so it, it was expected that it would have to turn on fuel eventually, um, but it has done incredible things for the field. Um, so just an idea of what Kepler did. Um, I want you all to take your fist and just kind of hold it out at uh, arm's length. Um, so what the area that your fist is covering up in your field of view is the amount of the sky that Kepler is looking at. And so Kepler is just staring at this little region of the sky, and there's all the rest of the sky that your fist is not covering up, um, but this is just a little bit that Kepler is looking at. So it's 115 square degrees, um, and it's just like this little area, and that's what we're seeing here. And so I'll start this animation, and I want you to just watch the time as it's moving forward, and all of these dots that are on this animation correspond to transit events. And so what you're going to see is that just in this little region of the sky that Kepler is staring at over time, over just this very short period of time, this whole animation is only for a week total, we're constantly seeing these transit events happening, um, which is just completely incredible. We have no idea what to expect. We just sent a telescope, pointed it, and said, okay, hopefully we see some of them, and they are just constantly happening all over the place with planets of all different sizes, all different temperatures, and it's just this huge diversity of planets that we were able to discover. Um, so Kepler was immensely successful and really, really did a lot to tell us about um, these kinds of planets. And something that made Kepler particularly remarkable is that it's really only able to see a very small percentage of the planets, even in that small region that we're looking at. So when you're looking at these transit events, it's really important that you have a very specific geometry in order to be able to actually see a transit at all. Um, so if you are going to have a transit event, that means the planet has to move in front of the star at some point. But if you're looking at the star and the planet is kind of in the plane of the sky, just moving in a circle in your field of view, you're not going to see a transit event because the planet is never going to move in front of the star. Uh, so it really has to be at this very specific geometry in order to see a transit event, which means that even in this little field of view, there are probably so many more planets that we just couldn't see because they're not in the right field geometry. Um, another thing that made Kepler particularly interesting is that because it is, has this observational bias and it can really mostly just see the planets with this particular geometry, it was very biased towards planets that are very close to our close star. Because if you have kind of a smaller circle for your orbit, then more of the inclinations will still lead to the planet passing in front of its host star. Um, whereas if you have a very large circle, then if you incline even a little bit, then the planet won't pass in front of its host star anymore. So what Kepler found was this whole new class of planetary systems that is completely unlike the solar system. Um, so I'm going to start another animation soon. And each of these circles has, you can 
imagine a star at the center. Um, so this is just a bunch of the different Kepler multi-planet systems, so systems with multiple planets that Kepler found, um, all lined up side by side so that we can compare them. And it's just incredible the diversity of these systems that we found. So the solar system is here to scale in the upper right, um, just so that you can see the comparison of the size scales of these different systems. And most of these systems are really, really tiny in comparison to the solar system, which means that the planets are really close to their stars. And it's amazing to see the huge number of types of planets that are in these configurations. So you can see that there are truly planets that are Jupiter-sized that are just looping around their stars super, super fast. And they, there are a lot of these planets that are moving around their stars within two to 10 days. So they are just kind of racing around their star incredibly fast, and they're right next to their star, way within the orbit of where Mercury, Mercury would be in our solar system. Uh, so this, the fact that all of these existed is kind of the reason that Kepler was so successful, and we didn't really know the extent to which these existed beforehand. So this has told us a lot about kind of crazy, wacky systems that exist out there that we had just never even thought might exist in the past. Uh, so, now we know that there's this huge diversity of planetary systems, and exoplanets are this extremely quickly growing field of just things that we really don't understand because we didn't even know that exoplanets existed for sure until about 20, 25 years ago. So it's just incredible what has been happening recently in this field. All right, so we talked now about a lot of the really weird things that were found by the Kepler system, but what about Earth now? So how close are we to find, finding something that's kind of more similar to Earth? Right? And how close are we to answering this question of are we alone? Which is often the main reason that people want to search for these planets. They want to know are there aliens, are there other forms of life out there, are we alone? And this is kind of an intrinsically interesting question for you guys. Um, so I can tell you about the things that we have found. Unfortunately, we have not found an Earth 2.0 yet. Um, we have found some things that are kind of along the road, and I can tell you a little bit about um, the discoveries that have been made in the field of exoplanets. Um, so these are a couple of the small habitable zone planets that were discovered by Kepler. Um, so these are all rocky planets that are about the size of the Earth, and in particular, these ones are in the habitable zone of their planet, where the habitable zone is defined as the region around the host star where liquid water can exist on the planet. So it means it's on the surface of the planet, which means that it's not too close to the star where all of the liquid water just evaporates, and it's not too far from the star where it all tends to ice. And these are just a few of these planets. Um, this is a slightly older figure, so more of these planets have been discovered since. And something I'd like to point out is that we're looking at all kinds of different stars. So the sun is an A-type star, and Earth is orbiting the sun, so it's within that category of Earth-sized planets around two stars that are in the habitable zone. Um, but we're also looking at all these different types of stars. So that kind of comes the question of how do these different environments around different stars it kind of influence whether or not there could be life. And for example, M stars are known to be very active. They have a lot of flaring, they have a lot of UV radiation that they're giving off all the time. And so this could have a profound influence on, as to whether or not life could be possible on these different types of planets. Um, so this is just a little bit of what we have so far. Um, however, we don't know too much about these planets yet. So most of you just know like, their size, and we might know their mass, but we really don't know too much more, because these are all just kind of stuff within that one field of view. So they're not necessarily the best targets in that they might not be that close to us, and they might be a little bit harder to study. Um, a particularly interesting uh, system that was discovered in 2015 is the Trappist 1 system. And this is a system of seven approximately Earth sized planets, where three of them are in the habitable zone of the planet. Uh, so, what we've copied out here is the host star is an N star, so it's a really active star. And so, science is kind of debating whether it would be possible for life to continue to pervade on these planets. But, um, that could be extreme aquatics, which are you know, types of organisms that exist in extreme environments, or it's, it's really hard to say whether life could or could not exist on these planets at this point. 
Um, but this is a more nearby system than most of the Pueblo stars, so it's a really good candidate to try to learn more about the atmospheres of these planets and to get more information about each of them. Uh, so I wanted to leave you with a little bit about some of the upcoming things that we can look forward to. Um, so I told you kind of some of the past things that we discovered and previous disturbance with Kepler and the Travis survey and the earth size planets that we have found. Um, but the tester of satellite, which was launched just a few months ago, is now searching for the planets around the most nearby stars. So it's searching all the sky, whereas Kepler just looked at that one little area, and it's trying to find the best candidates throughout all of the sky um, for future observation, follow-up, uh, and learning more about uh, these different types of planets. So what TESS is doing is it's looking at these sort of long, rectangular sort of regions of the sky, and it's scanning different regions for 27 days each. So starting with the southern hemisphere, it's just going around and looking at each of these bits for 27 days, and then going to the northern hemisphere, and looking again for 27 days at each of these regions. And it's knocking out about 80% of the sky, 85%. Um, that's the Kepler field, just paying for reference, and these are the K2 fields, which are regions that Kepler looked at after its main mission. And so what TESS is going to be looking for is the most nearby planets. Now these are particularly interesting again because that means we can study them in greater depth. And also, if we did find life on them, then we would be much more likely to be able to actually go to them someday. So uh, what also was just shown here was the James Webb spacecraft, which is not the test spacecraft, but it's another one that will be launched in a couple of years. Um, that should be able to characterize the atmospheres of all of these planets in greater detail. So already we know that there are organic molecules in the atmospheres of all planets. So we found water in the atmospheric planets, we found methane, um, etc. There's various molecules in some of the planets, but a lot of them are quite difficult to study. Um, so the James Webb Space Telescope will be really helpful for that, and it will be much more capable of studying these planets at higher resolution. Um, so with that, I will take any questions, and thank you so much for listening, and uh...
Um, yeah, so it's really hard to say when we'll find another. Uh, right now, most of these planets we just know about how big they are. So generally, we know their radius, which is their size, and sometimes their mass. Uh, it's really hard to find the smaller planets because they create a small signal. They, the smaller your planet is, the less light is blocking out from the star, so it looks like a smaller dip. You don't see quite so strong a signal. Um, but it's hard to say exactly when that will happen. I think once we learn more about the molecules in the atmosphere, then we'll have kind of a better idea of what these planets are actually like. But right now, we have kind of minimal information about Earth's size planet. If, um, you know this got renamed a planet, why do they still call it a dwarf planet? Oh, so Pluto is not renamed a planet. Pluto is still a dwarf planet. <laughs> so Pluto was demoted from its planet status, I think in 2008, um, a while ago. It was still, some of you probably never knew Pluto as a planet. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I, I think I was in elementary school when it was devoted. Uh, everyone's very sad about it. <laughs> well, not everyone, some people. <laughs> um, can you elaborate more how the sun is a star? Yeah, so the sun is, it's, it's actually just like all those other stars that we see in the night sky. It's just that it looks really big to us because we're right next to it. But if any of those other stars that are in the night sky were really close to us, then they would look a lot like our sun. Or they, you might have different types of stars, so they might look a little bit different. Uh, but the sun is just one among many, many stars, and it just looks different because we're just right next to it. But we could have been right next to a different star, and then we would think of that, that as our sun. So Yeah, so an orbit is the path that a planet takes around its star. Um, so a planet moves in generally something kind of like a circle around its star, and that is what defines actually a year, is how long it takes for the planet to move around the star. Um, so our year is 365 days, and that means that it takes the Earth 365 days to get around the sun. Um, so the orbit is just that path around the sun. Uh, what is the level of sun in the planet B? What is the level of the what is the level of the sun in the Are you talking to the microphone? Uh, how big? The, what is the level of the sun in the plan uh, compared to the B? Compared to C? So, the different sun, how we are Earth, the planets are sun. Okay, so um, generally the. So, generally the. It's actually hard to make those general because different stars are really different sizes. Um, but the, if you have a star that is about the size of the sun and you have a Jupiter-sized planet, then it's pretty standard that it might block about 1% of the light of the star. Um, so it's, that means that the area of the planet, if you just kind of look at the circle that it looks like on the sky, is about 1% of the area of the sun. And then, actually not my Jupiter-sized planet, um, so it's generally kind of on the order 